And then the next, it's my pleasure now to introduce you, Dr. Susie Attiwi, who is Associate Professor of Interior Design and Deputy Dean of Learning and Teaching in the RMIT School of Architecture and Design, Melbourne, Australia. Since 1991, she has had an independent practice which involves the design of exhibitions, curatorial work, writing and working on a range of interdisciplinary projects in Australia and overseas. And I know that Susie at first uh, learned mm, art history and uh, he did her masters later in RMIT as well as practice-based uh, PhD research some years ago. And now she's leading or running the, uh, the PhD program in RMIT of uh, the interior uh, PhD candidates. From 206 to 212, she was the chair of IDEA, which is Interior Design, Interior Architecture, Educate, Educators Association, and now she's, she's the editor of the IDEA journal. She's a founding member of the Urban Interior Laboratory. When I asked yesterday from Susie about her <laughs> hobbies, she told that <laughs> her life is her hobby. But anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she's interested in bodybuilding. Please, well, I Susie. Do bodybuilding. <laughs> you are welcome. But I'm not going to look at it. <laughs> Thank you. So I hope hope you're all okay, still sitting for another hour. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation to present at this symposium. Tune and Irmo came to Melbourne, Australia last year and they presented <coughs> an intensive course in interior in our program. And it was very um, exciting to meet them and then also through their, through their intensive to um, understand further about their um, way of thinking about interior architecture, their practice and also just getting through that, um, a sense of Estonian culture and history. And particularly with the project that they also, unfortunately I wasn't there for the lecture, I was away overseas, but um, through them and through the catalogue that they gave me, the, the project How Long is the Life of a Building, which is a wonderful project. So it's very nice to be here also, to be able to go and visit that building and, and certainly probably not get inside, but be able to project myself inside through your project. Um, I've also um, been aware of the Estonian Society of Interior Architects through um, the International Federation of Interior Architects and Designers. And I, I use the long term because IFI um, in As Australian language means that it's kind of comsi, comsa, you know, like it's a bit iffy. It's kind of, and so that doesn't seem like a very good way to re refer to it. Um, but oh, as chair of the Interior Design, Interior Architecture Educators Association, I participated in their meetings. And I think it was, we were talking about it last night that at the meeting in Korea, I think that in fact both Irmo and Tuna were there, but we didn't meet. So it's kind of nice that we've connected up again. So with my presentation, um, obviously I don't have a difficulty with English so much, but some people would say that the Australian accent makes it very difficult for people you know, from England to understand me. But I, I, have, I do have a bit of a problem with language due to jet lag, I think. Um, it's taken me 34 hours to travel here. And um, what that means is, you know, I, tend, I might tend to forget what I'm talking about <laughs> in mid-sentence. So I might just have to refer to my notes a bit more than I normally would. But I guess what I'd like to do with my talk is to address the title, the provocation of the title of the symposium the dynamics of history, uh, the dynamics of theory and practice. And this, you know, particularly the idea of dynamic, which highlights the relationship between them, as well as each its own field of endeavor. And so this is going to be a discussion and presentation of ideas, which draw upon my own practice and research and teaching, as well as some projects, and really hear from a community of practice um, involving students who, um, both undergraduate students in the interior design program and also PhD candidates, as well as colleagues who I work with. And I don't know, it might be maybe a little bit like Yoka's presentation to a bit of a history theory lecture, 
as a way of sort of introducing the symposium. So I was, I was quite taken by the image that was um, part of the call for, for the conference for the symposium and the provocation here between these kind of two figures of what's um, real and what's natural and the idea of kind of theoretical ideas and how they sort of inform the ways of, you know, how we sort of see the world and produce the world. And also how, how these ideas really shape and inform practice, often in ways that people, you know, that one's not aware of them, they almost seem natural, but they kind of come through and get expressed in material and form. And also the way that we see them, like for example, the idea of the ideal female body is also, you know, very much a theoretical context or framework. And I guess just in terms, my provocation here a bit today is that um, an example of this for me within interior design, interior architecture, is the assumption that space exists and that interior design and interior architects work with existing space. So in my practice, I'm very interested in this dynamic and also the value of thinking about the relationship of theory and practice for interior design practice and not, not just education. And I think that if we th think through this, that um, in terms of what the practice of interior design has to offer the 21st century, the role that it has to play becomes very exciting. Before I go on though, just a bit of an introduction um, to perhaps give you a bit of a background to my, my interests and why, why I'm sort of um, thinking along these lines is that my first degree was in art history and then it was only much later when I was 28 that I studied interior design as an undergraduate student. And with my art history study, I enjoyed it, but I found that the discipline didn't suit me being a historian and that I really wanted to make things. And I guess at that time as a, somebody straight out of high school, you know, at the age of 21, that I you know, was thinking that after making things, I realized that I probably need to think about what I was going to do to make, you know, to, to have a sort of career of some sort. And interior design seemed like an interesting kind of proposition I wasn't kind of, it wasn't something I dreamed about since I was, you know, young, which a lot of students applying to come into our course and say, I've always wanted to be an interior designer. Well, I never, never sort of had that longing to do it. But it was an extraordinary um, undertaking, it was extraordinary, extraordinary time of study. When I joined the course at RMIT, it was just, it was going under significant change, and this is back in 1990, so that gives you an idea of how old I am, I guess. But, um, so RMIT, just, a brief introduction, it's the oldest interior program in Australia and it was, it began in 1949. And it's also just one of two programs in Australia at a university level, uh, at a three to four year um, undergraduate degree program, that still calls itself interior design. All the others have changed their names to interior architecture. It's an interesting point because I think it's maybe similar here um, to some degree, but in Australia, you can't call yourself an interior architect unless you have an architecture degree. So there's students that are studying interior architecture that will graduate, but they can't call themselves interior architects. But our program, and I think it'll become clear as I talk um, and give you my position, why we've stayed with the term interior design in all its complexities and in all its misunderstandings. But just in 1990, it moved um, the program with a new, we had a new head that came from the UK, John Andrews, and um, he really shifted the whole program from one which was focused on industry and commercial interior design practice to one which foregrounded spatial experience and interior design as an expanded practice. And I guess this is just an ongoing controversial position that we have in the relationship between industry and education. And it was sort of, you know, I think the kind of conversations that we had just before around, well, is there any, you know, good edu you know, programs, education programs recognized by the ECIA? Um, you know, there's always this tension, it seems, between education and the profession for, for, for different reasons. And I guess, you know, it's an ongoing issue for us in Australia with professional organizations such as the IFI in the Design Institute of Australia. And this idea that education should be training for commercial practice, for commercial outcomes. 
But RMIT also has this kind of mandate, it's a technical college before it became a university, that they want to produce what they call work-ready graduates, graduates that can go out and work. But coupled with this, it's not necessarily saying that they're training students to go out, you know, as, as kind of, well, you're ready, you can, you can go out and practice. It's being work ready, which has got a kind of, and maybe I think it's picking up on some of the points that the new ECIA charter has there of what, what it is that a student, student needs. But I guess coupled with this is also what we call this idea of venturous practice. And the idea of venturous practice, it's like adventurous, but it's, it's venturous. It's, it's really encouraging our students to go out and push the boundaries of what practice might be and to, t to take risks in order to really embrace this idea of design as an agent of change. And there is obviously is going to produce this confrontation with industry, but in some ways it's, it's only particular parts of industry and the profession within Australia anyway, you know, that I can speak of. I'm, you know, it'd be interesting to hear about the differences, I think. But you know, we, I, we, we have many practices that really embrace this idea of students coming out who want to push the ideas and experiment with what interior can be and might be, and they really embrace this kind of attitude coming from, from students. It's really practices that are very conservative and don't you know, want to be certain about making the dollar in the end or whatever, that, that really kind of, I think, feel a bit threatened by students that are coming out who are full of ideas and want to change the future. Anyway, just coming back to this model of, um, that was introduced, was very much based at that time in the 1990s on the Architectural Association in London and, and this idea of the design studio, which was being offered by practitioners, people from, the, from professions coming in, doing project-based work, which was experimental, exciting, contemporary. And since then, we've, we have studios that form the core of our, all, our, all our program. And no studio is offered again, it's a one-off, studio that runs for the duration of the whole semester. And it's very much about integrating ideas with designing. Um, and very, you know, this dynamic again of theory and practice, but without seeing them kind of separate as either or, but how ideas, how theory is practice and how practice is theory. And so the briefs are very much provocations to expand on ideas of what interior design can be and can do. And the interior design program at RMIT is recognized internationally for this. But nevertheless, just coming back to me, I guess as a student, when I, when I was doing, studying this, I also began to appreciate my art history background because at that time it gave me an ability to conceptualize and understand ideas and theory. And through this, the criticality of sort of a broader context within which interior was operating. And this was something that my fellow students who had come straight out of school, say, did not have. And their, their designs were very much about immediate issues and their own projections. They weren't historically, socially, let alone politically engaged kind of propositions. And it ends up being about themselves, which is, a, is very much a confrontation for design students, particularly in interior design, when they're wanting to design for others. One last experience on me at, as an undergraduate, but at that time, you know, this was a time of transition, and uh, we were taught in history a history of furniture, of objects, and um, I found this very complex. Uh, you know, um, I didn't, I couldn't work out why, because in the studios with these new studios that we were doing, that were being introduced, it was all about spatial ideas, not objects, not furniture in space, and so. Um, because of my art history background, I then went on to become and, and joined uh, the program as, a history, as the history theory coordinator. And it was an opportunity for me to address the issues that I saw and the differences between the history and theory course that I did and the one that I thought um, could be done for what a history and theory of interior design might be. And I developed a series of lectures called Towards a History and Theory of Interior Design because I also felt that the history and theories that, that were architectural were also not adequate for kind of thinking through the ideas and the issues that were there. Um, so I really wanted to empower students to think theoretically and critically, and in a way which brought my background in art history 
in relationship to interior design. And you know, this, this was um, one of the references, or I guess one of the key kind of um, areas that we looked at and uh, with the futurist's work. And it's fantastic, if you can see from here, you know, it's the idea about a door, you know, a window frame actually piercing the head of somebody. And on this side, a shaft of light going through this woman's head. And, um, you know, they were really interested in this idea of the integration of the environment and people and, you know, speaking about this idea of interior forces, rather than seeing things as sort of space and object, but bringing them together in a dynamic kind of relationship. And also, with my practice in interior design stemming from art history, you know, I, became, I developed the practice in exhibition design, and, um, and it was very much through thinking through exhibition design that I thought through ideas and experiments with this question of what interior might be. And I guess here's another theoretical kind of concept for you. One, which is just in every standard exhibition design book, this is how you hang a painting. But in fact, you know, it's full of theoretical ideas about where is, you know, the hori horizon line that something should be engaged with through, through the eye at that level. And, you know, within a white cube, as we call it, you know, a neutral white space. And these are all kind of idea, theoretical ideas that are based on platonic ideas of the ideal and a pri privileging of a Cartesian known subject. And what I was interested in was looking at how exhibitions and museum spaces are designs and how space, movement, program, material, lighting all actually produce knowledge. You know, they're just not revealing knowledge, they actually produce how we encounter things in the world. And, you know, this was, you know, how you collect images and references and things that you love when, you, when you're doing research. Well, this was an image that I came across in a book and um, just, you know, it's been with me for a long time. It's just, well, what is this, you know, how, how might you speak about this relationship between, you know, this Rapa Nui statue which had been sort of taken from Rapa Nui and brought to the British Museum and now here's this guy standing beside it in a bowler hat. And, you know, this is a number of, um, a century later, this is me standing beside the same statue. And it's just this kind of relationship, you know, that, that, that I'm fascinated with in terms of thinking about interior and how that these produce our encounters and our ways of being in the world. And this, I'm not going to give you too much of a history lecture, but this is just another important reference for me. And this is the same room, and it's just hung differently, um, you know, coming through my interest in exhibition design. But, you know, this, the top one is from 1930, and the bottom one is from 1917. And there's this very well-known um, director of the museum at the time, Alexander Dorner, who um, wrote, a, you know, a, a kind of manifesto for the way beyond art. He was very interested in how to sort of make the museum become this kind of energy force rather than um, thinking about things as um, immutable objects. But he was also somebody that um, he, he had a, a, this kind of idea of atmosphere rooms and uh, to create the atmosphere of different kinds of um, times and periods. But it's just, you know, it's interesting here just to see that the top one in relationship to this idea of a modernist hang and coming back to that diagram that I showed you at the beginning, and how this really shows very different ways of, you know, of, of understanding the world and of being in the world and, and what it is to, 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 and how design actually contributes to that. So for me, um, interior, and I'm going to have to speed up now, so I hope you're understanding my English kind of okay, but for me, interior as a concept has been key to thinking and critically engaging with these problematics. And for me, in thinking about interior, it's about a spatial, temporal, and material practice. And this is why I prefer the term interior design, as it can be understood as the designing of interior. It activates this idea of interior as a designing. Um, interior architecture and interior decoration are practices that take place already inside something. The interior is given to some degree. And, you know, this is a very small, this is off the internet, but um, I think that, you know, the fact that I grew up in Australia also inflects my way of thinking and working. And, um, for example, the relationship with history in Australia is quite different to that in Europe. Australian history for a long time was taught in schools as only being 200 years old. 
you know, that there was that that that's w that that was our history, and um, and that Australia was new and a new country. This whole idea of it being a new country, but this is a history of colonialism by the the British, and you know, of course, the Indigenous people of Australia have been there for thousands of years, and they don't have an idea of history for them. They have a very different relationship to what past is. You know, past is part of the present and, and the future. There's a, continu a, a continuous sort of relation. And so, you know, again, these ideas of how we sort of are in the world and think about it. And I guess the other thing is that Australia is a really huge country, and that's why I've got this slide here, is because there's, um, you know, England or the Britain which colonised us, and it's sort of, you can get the sense of its actual size in contrast to the size of Australia. And just some ca comparisons between population, like the UK, the population is currently six, something like 63 million, and in Australia it's only 23 million. And in the UK, it, this translates to 250 people per square kilometre, and in Australia it's only 2.5. So very different kind of, it was interesting to hear about the, the earlier mention about kind of relations to space. And I think in Australia, you know, like it's not so conscious, but it's more an unconscious issue, but this idea of the occupation of space by, by colonialism, who, you know, by colonists who declared it at what we, this term terra nullius, which is a blank canvas, nothing exists. They came, they saw this very flat, open space with hardly any people in it and thought, well, there's nothing happening here. We can just take it over, you know, like, and um, it, the other interesting thing to note with Australia too is that most of the population live around the edges and that the centre of Australia, which is mainly desert, has hardly, very, is not a lot of people living there. So this was um, uh, a magazine that, was started up by John Andrews, who, when he came and joined the program, and did the transformations of the, the, the program in the early 1990s, he started up a magazine or called The Interior. And it was really about this repositioning of interior and thinking about it um, in terms of um, anthropology, in terms of art, in terms of um, you know, a whole range of other kinds of disciplines were invited to come in and um, think about the interior in relationship to this publication and make contributions and write. Um, but it's also interesting, just this cover, because it's, this is Uluru, which is in the centre of Australia, and it's a very important indigenous Aboriginal um, um, kind of country. And for many, many years, um, tourists would come and climb Uluru, or as, as it was known was Ayers Rock, and I think you can even see just up the top there a little white figure on it. But um, then, you know, around, just after this time of this publication, um, the various different um, rites went through which prevent now people from climbing this sacred place, this rock. And so there's just this spatial complexity that we have and a sensitivity of how we occupy space and what context or site specificity involves. And there's also then, you know, as I was saying, this relationship with history and time, a very a, a complex temporal dimension to, to how, how you know, we feel in the space. And I, not everybody's aware of it, but perhaps I think that artists and designers tend to be, and certainly artists more so. So to return to the conference provocation, I'll just keep that up for a bit. My talk thinking about this specifically in relationship to interior design and the question of interior. And theory and practice are often positioned as two distinct concerns and approaches. Theory is the realm of ideas and methods which are applied to practice and practice tests out these theories. And then it's kind of the job of theoreticians who come in to theorize practice. And so practice is seen as this idea of doing and making, designing, drawing on experience, dealing with budgets and timelines. And often, you know, um, designers will talk about this idea of being intuitive, or will I just kind of do it, and, and, and dismiss theory and the idea of, um, you know, privileging the idea of working with materials and space, a kind of sensitivity and sensibility. But I, I suppose I just, you know, I've always questioned whether it's really possible to be without theory. 
culture and social ideas underpin ways of thinking and bring this to any kind of design practice. And a practitioner in the 19th century is very different from a practitioner in the 20th first century. So rather than thinking about the same, you know, either or in terms of uh, this relationship between theory and practice, I think, you know, it's really just thinking about this dynamic between them. And there's a very, there's a philosopher who I refer to quite a bit, um, Gilles Deleuze, a French philosopher, and he has this nice idea of that theory is a box of tools, that it should be useful, and it should be useful for the, for the person working with things, and if it's not useful, chuck it out and get, get, get another box of tools, or it's a, a lens, a pair of glasses, a way of sort of seeing through them to see the world and to work with them. And this is, the term practical philosophy comes from him, because he writes about this idea that we should have a philosophy of what we do, not what, what things are about or what there is. And this means that philosophy and you know, theory is a way of knowing and understanding the world that comes through doing, through making and constructing. And you know, I think it's quite important, just as a kind of proposition, that this, the idea that knowledge is produced rather than as something that kind of pre-exists. So with interior design theory and practice, you know, the current state of it is not, you know, it, there's in the past 10 years, say, there's been um, more books that have been kind of published, but th it's quite interesting how there's not a lot of theory um, and history in relationship to, to interior. There's a lot of what we call in Australia coffee table books, like very beautiful, um, full photograph books. But there's, you know, when you go to the bookshelf in, um, in a bookstore, you know, there's lots and lots of architecture and art books and, you know, like this kind of whole culture of this thinking, but, but not so much in the interior. And, you know, I guess it comes back to this idea of, you know, the history of the profession um, only being, you know, a century old and coming from the upholsterers and the inside of architecture and so on. Um, but, you know, I just think that there's kind of this potential to start thinking and opening up interior in a range of kind of ways. And through this idea of um, interior design as a designing of interior has the potential to engage with these new terrains of practice which are invited through new technologies and globalism as ideas of space are transformed and challenged. And I think we are really, you know, every, every time is different but it's very interesting at the moment with mass migration and urban density and contemporary technologies, which are really very much changing how people have a sense of living in the world, of a sense of place, a sense of belonging, and, and modes of living. And so it seems like a really critical time, I think, for interior designers and interior architects to be picking up this challenge and to be not working with assumptions, but to be pushing the boundaries, to be pushing the ideas. And I, it's, I, I feel that um, it's also important, you know, I, I just feel that the profession is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's one that's sort of come through over the past hundred years through a period that's been dealing, you know, like a sort of capitalist consumer society. And a lot of its kind of thinking is organized around the criticality of kind of projects coming, you know, in on time and, and on budget. And those are important things, but how, how else we might be opening up to other ideas? I'm just kind of rambling here a bit. I've just got to get back to my... Um, and so while there's been an increase in publications, and this, this is you know, a very recent one that you might be aware of. It's kind of got a large number of um, essays in it. It's almost like an encyclopedia. Um, but what happens is that the, the kind of term interior is very rarely opened up and addressed, and even though interior design is a practice of des designing interior. And whether interiors, interior design, interior architecture, or interior decoration, the word interior is generally understood as enclosed, three-dimensional space and a practice of the built environment, and that the word space is kind of interchangeable with interior. And this, kind, this understanding of uh, interior is reiterated through dominant narratives of interior design practice and history, and this is just an example of one of them. You know, the history of interior design, and I think it's in about its 11th edition. And, you know, just this statement that they're part of the structures that, that, that contain them, usually built buildings, 
and they have to be studied within an architectural context. And then the IFI website also has um, on it a definition of interior design, interior architecture, um, and says that it's the only one to have as its end product, grounded in the sculpting of negative space rather than the production of a positive object and that the core of interiors lies in an understanding of the abstract qualities of shaping this negative space or void. I mean, these are two powerful theoretical frameworks. They're not kind of natural statements of, of, you know, well, this is how the world is. And I suppose from my own point of view, the other aspect, the other interior I'm interested in is also this, the person who inhabits this space. And this is, this, this is also, as a subject, is understood as an interior, you know, as a as a centred, contained self. Again, this is a way, a theoretical, philosophical idea. And interior is really opened up and posed as a question. The other thing just to put in there, I think there's a very interesting chapter in um, Adrian Forty's book called World, Words and Buildings, and it's a chapter on space. And just to read that, to, to understand the history of the word space in relationship to architecture, um, you know, it's, it's a term that was only started to really be used in, in the 1900s, in the 20th century, together with modernism, and in English, you know, in, in the 1940s. So it's not, it's not a term that, or, or a kind of way of thinking, even architecture, that's just kind of, you know, to be assumed that that's what it is. And, you know, my, you know I won't, can't go into it here, but I think there's a very interesting relationship then with the emergence of interior design interior architecture as a profession during modernism and how it's picked up on this idea of space and, and in relationship to architecture. And perhaps it's an opportunity now to change that, to think of other ways, what other trajectories than thinking about um, space. And I guess that's my sort of proposition and um, what I'm working with. This is you know, a wonderful example of how to think about space, Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion. So just onto this kind of proposition that I have, which is question mark interior. And it's, it's kind of, rather than having the question mark after interior, which asks, you know, it's like going, well, what is interior? The question mark before is always, oh, you know, like produces somebody to pause or stumble or go, well, what's that mean? And can't even really say it, you know, like, um, but the thing is that that's, that's the key point, is that each time to be th coming across this word interior is to think it anew, to open it up, because it's situational, it's temporal, it's spatial, it's cultural, it's dynamic. And I think that as interior designers and students, that that's, what, what, that's, a, that's, what, that's the practice that we have, is to be able to work in that kind of contingent um, mode and um, to be able to, I sort of make the difference between rather than thinking about site specificity is we're always making site specific, to make it specific and singular. And I think that there's a really marvelous kind of um, expertise, if you like, that, that, that we have in doing that. And it, but what it comes up against is kind of the desire for certainty and you know, knowledge and expertise and to, to, to sort of have all of that clearly positioned, but if, if we move slightly to the, the left or the right of that and kind of go, okay, well, perhaps for us, you know, like what it is, how we are to be evaluated is in what we do. Not, not to say what we do beforehand, but in what we do. And this, I think, engages with a lot of contemporary culture now, you know, like there's the whole idea of what knowledge is is really shifting as well from, you know, and it's for somebody to have expertise and a knowledge, um, it's a very hard thing to maintain these days because knowledge is just changing so rapidly. Um, so through practice, I experiment with um, opening up this question of interior as a problematic, as something to, to be thought of each time anew. And particularly around kind of questions of space and subjectivity and um, to, to sort of be posing them with each different project. And I think that um, the pra idea of practical philosophy is important for the profession as well as education. And because it sort of needs to become philosophically interested, I think, the profession. And it, it hasn't, and it doesn't at the moment. But it needs to. And we, 
as um, Tunay said, we run a PhD, you know, a Doctor of Philosophy program at RMIT. And the importance of engaging with ideas within practice is um, sort of critical, I think, for the, impre the, the profession to, to um, transform and to evolve. And I'll show some work in a moment. So this is just a big shift in terms of um, away from earlier ideas of knowledge and so on, and also the idea of education being training. And it really emphasizes the need to experiment and to um, work out ways of doing that. So just very briefly, just here's some student projects, um, this undergraduate student projects, thinking about um, you know, responding to different briefs, I guess, within studios. And I won't talk to them too much because, you know, I'm running out of time, but you may not, might not be able to see this down the bottom, but this is called How to Be in Two Spaces at the Same Time on, on this side, and then the other one is How to Join Forces. And this was a project which was working with um, a house that was um, due for demolition, and students were asked to kind of transform it. And this, li this isn't Photoshop, it's actually a tree that's been brought inside. And just these are some posters that we have for studios that we run, as that I was mentioning. Each studio is unique and is offered once, and with practitioners and a group of students, 20 students, and really around kind of ideas and projects and contemporary issues, competitions. Um, often students will be working on projects that are kind of in, in practices at that time, and it becomes a research kind of laboratory for thinking through a range of um, issues and scenarios and sometimes they're quite theoretical like this one how to encounter smudges and surfaces in the sublime we also have very much a kind of nice crossover with with um, art and design and this is just um, a, a studio taking place and this is um, a PhD work in progress review and I guess one of the kind of important things that happens in the school and you know like also in um, other places such as um, St. Lucas in Brussels, is um, inviting practitioners to come in and do a PhD and reflect on their practice. And that it's, it's actually thinking about through the medium of designing. So it's not bringing in theory onto practice, but it's through practice developing this kind of way of thinking about it. And, you know, like I spoke at the, the meeting in Amsterdam last year that Yoko referred to, and. Um, making a pitch for interior designers to really come on, do a PhD, <laughs> you know, because it's just, it's, I think it's the same here in um, Europe, but, you know, in Australia, all the architects are doing PhDs by practice, and, but, you know, in, in Australia, it's not, there's not even a call within the profession for our graduates to have a master's degree, you know, like it's just, it, it, it's just a kind of, um, I think a lack of leadership that's there with the profession a bit in terms of thinking about, well, you know, we've got really complex, big issues, big ideas in the 21st century and how are we going to, to kind of embrace them and through, through our practice. So these are some examinations of PhDs. Um, and again, the profession comes in and they're involved, peers are involved in those examinations. This is, Elizabeth Ross is an Australian philosopher who's been living in the States for a long time, but she's somebody that um, you know, we invited to one of our symposiums a while ago called Inside Out. She just makes these very interesting kind of propositions about space, and this one, you know, a certain habit of thought inverts the relation between space and objects, space and extension, to make it seem as if space precedes objects, when in fact space itself is produced through matter, extension and movement. And I guess it's not really a question of going, well, you know, is that, is that the truth of the world or not? But it's like, what an interesting provocation to design, to think not about, and, you know, here I speak as an exhibition designer, not to be thinking about an object in space and, you know, you move it around, but going back to the futurist kind of um, proposition as well, is to be thinking about matter extension and movement and how that, how as an interior designer, you know, you're working with that to produce kind of space and objects. You know, they're the outcome of what you're doing rather than what you're working with. And so just, just down, you know, the bottom one with the question mark interior, I guess these are the three main things that I really question 
this idea of the person as a psychological subject. I mean, that's kind of, there's all this discussion in interior design about well-being and, um, you know, human-centeredness and so on. But there's no questioning about, well, who or what are we talking about? You know, it, the idea of what it is, what, what human is to begin with. Um, and then also just this idea that a psychological subject, again, is a theoretical way of thinking about what this is. It's not the only, you know, there's other ways of thinking about that. And also space is the inside of architecture. And critically, time as a product of space. And again, Elizabeth Gross and others are people that say, well, actually we should think of time first. Not, not as a product of space, not, not as a kind of move, me moving from here to there, is, that's a measure of time. But actually that we're in time, and going back to the indigenous um, reference earlier on, no, this maybe this sense that, that kind of to be in time in past, present, future. You know, like it's very difficult things to think about, but you know how 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 might we work with that to make space? It's just you know these are I, again the kind of propositions that I think once you start to open up these ideas and realize that if you're talking about time or space, that you can think about them differently and how that can, can contribute to to practice. This is just a, a poster from the conference that Elizabeth Cross spoke at, and this was in 2005. And what we were interested to do, and it was followed by another one in 2012 called Flow, and it was about bringing interior design and landscape architecture together for a conversation. In, at RMIT, lands, we have a landscape architecture program. So, you know, I was kind of pretty excited because I'm, you know, it was about taking architecture out of the middle, you know, like, let's just chuck it out and just, Sorry, my Australian expressions chuck it out, but you know, but to sort of see, well, you know, if we don't have this thing, this wall that's mediating inside and outside, and landscape architecture this side, and interior design on the inside, what 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 can we talk about, or what what new ways of um, relations and things might we think through? And then um, I just want to show a couple of projects, which. Um, were prop propositions that we made to students. And this was part of um, uh, urban interior studio that I ran as part of this urban interior laboratory that, um, that I'm involved with. And the urban interior laboratory is making a proposition about interior design practice within the urban environment. And one which is addressing issues of increasing density and um, human inhabitation within cities. And also, um, just how this relationship of how we might utilize space then, um, how, how we can transform program through program how space is utilized and, and well produced. And it's very interesting, I was last year I was just invited to, to run a workshop in Milan and they've started up a Master of Urban Interior Design with the University of Madrid as well. So there's this kind of increase, you know, a, a evolving interest in thinking about interior design as a practice within the urban environment. And again, you know, what it, what it kind of attends to and brings to is a sort of sensibility of a way of thinking about the relationship between, pe between people and the environment and this idea of how, of, of inhabitation. And so the provocation that we gave um, students, this was part of a much larger competition called Melbourne in 2050 an idea you know, around what, how the city would change. And so we invited them to um, think about how, what, what kind of tools there might be for making urban interiors and to move away from thinking about site, you know, it, because site is a very architectural term, to thinking about situations. And then how, um, if they went out into the, the, the kind of street and not, you know, sort of also, um, not wanting to rely on, because there, there's a whole history with the urban environment becoming an interior with Camellia City's work and you know this idea of how the, the square becomes a living room and, and so on. But again, that's kind of like the inversion of the inside of a building. You're still relying on the built environment to kind of give the shape of the interior. We were interested in thinking, well, we're not sort of saying that's how the interior is formed by the built fabric then how um, are there other ways? And so um, this, this idea of situation became important. We asked students to do interior plans within the outside. And Alice Kohler's work here 
this is a mapping of, of movement. And what she was interested in was how kind of these, these intensities and densities of movement started to indicate kind of places where people would slow down and inhabit, you know, spend time somewhere. And there's ob also observations of, of how, um, you know, people organize themselves within, within the street at, and attention to that. This is just a kind of aerial view of some of those things. So, you know, these are, these are kind of all still ideas that are bubbling away. And um, this, this was a project that was a proposition by uh, Sarah Jamison, which was looking at trams moving in the street and how through their interaction and their stopping and starting that they could produce a thermal environment that would then be taken through into the rest of you know, the infrastructure of the, um, the intersection through the seating and the light poles. And uh, this is you know, a, a kind of um, image which is just expressing that and with the pinholes through the actual sheet of paper to get this sense of sort of this thermal environment. And then this is the work of a master's student from Singapore who did a very detailed analysis of street vendors and how they inhabit and, out, you know, and set up in a temporary way to inhabit space. Just to read from Shan's um, masters, because it's just a very nice way that she describes this, but um, she was interested in this idea of intensification and interiorization, and she writes, as agents of the street, Vendor's practices provide the framework for spatial arrangements of intimate and temporal scale. The production of interiors is positioned as a practice constantly adaptable to re-engage with the conditions of its surroundings. An opportunity-dependent practice, poaching, inviting pauses, and being mobile are analyzed as tactics for interiorization. And then just the last kind of project that, um, you know, have I got a little bit more time? Yeah? Um, this is uh, Urban Interior. This was a book that we made as a group. It's a group that in, in includes interior designers as well as um, artists, landscape architects, and um, industrial designers. And working, uh, you know, we do mainly at the moment, it's, it has been a practice of making installations as kind of provocations for thinking about ideas. Um, and But we're sort of moving towards... Um, kind of doing actual interventions and projects. But this is just a very nice little project that we did as part of an exhibition. It's called a ride on dinner. And it invited people to bring bikes in through the gallery and um, all met outside the gallery in the space between two buildings and um, had uh, entree. The start of the meal was prepared here and everybody sort of had these serviettes and all the kind of accessories for a dinner. And then everyone was invited to get onto their bikes. And basically, there was this ride around Melbourne, and it was at staying at, stopping at different places in the city to meet and have dinner. And there was this kitchen, a mobile kitchen, that went around to produce the food at different points. So just a different kind of occupation and habitation in, in an interior way through eating, meeting, sitting, you know, um, engagement there. And this is the last project. This is kind of current work that's being offered mainly as a design studio at the moment, but it's a project where I'm working with a consultant psychologist who came to interior design. Um, he works in these houses which are um, called residential care houses that are for young people who have been taken away from their homes because they're under the age of 18 and placed into state care government care because they're at, um, you know, they're, they're, they're at risk of being abused or neglected, sexually abused where, where they live with their families. So they have to be removed and placed in, into care. But this psychologist who came to see me, you know, he thought, obviously he thought, oh, interior design, I'll go to the interior des head of interior design for them to brighten up these environments, you know, like do a bit of colour, furnishings and so on. But from there, it's become a very interesting relation because he's actually become aware of how, you know, we're, we're, we're interested in s spatial qui questions and temporal questions and how, what's the rhythm of how these spaces are op occupied and all the sight lines and relationships between things and how these activa activate a certain kind of atmosphere 
and, and environment. And so we've been running a series of design studios with students looking at these various different, these are the insides of these buildings and you can see how awful they are in terms of, they're meant to be houses, you know, they're homes for where somebody lives, but very institutional and they're all just completely based around, oh well, you know, we've got to keep them safe and we've got to be able to sort of know if they're leaving um, or if somebody's coming in. And while these kids haven't done anything wrong, it's almost like they are living in prison. And so, you know, it's been a great project because while the students are a little bit older than the kids that are living there, they're still bringing this, this kind of feeling and response to these spaces. And so the departments that we're working with are very enthusiastic to sort of see the propositions that the students are making. And while they might be a little bit naive in some ways or, you know, not be able to be done, they've actually um, affected transformation in a number of new houses being built in different ways. And so this is just, you know, like this student, Felicity, responded to that the space that I showed previously. Just, you know, there's this, just this sense of staleness, you know, like that, that it just felt stale, that there's no movement at all. And so her project became about sort of thinking about how can one start to create a sense of movement and circulation through the space by working with light and how people, you know, would actually be encouraged to, to move through the space. And then... You know, there's a series of projects where we invited students to work with watercolour, um, and that's become quite an important medium for, you know, and again, an interesting interior design medium to think, because watercolour, um, when you use it, it doesn't necessarily stay within the contours of the drawn form. And so it's quite expressive in terms of um, atmospheres and, and feelings. My last four slides, this is um, a PhD candidate, current one, and um, this is a, somebody who's been working with me on this project, which we've called Beyond Building. And um, her PhD is very much about thinking about how interior design can be a practice of care and what, what that means and the ethical kind of issues that, that, that come through from that. And her practice is in watercolour, so this is where you can sort of see, um, you know, in this image that she has uh, where you know, through the technique of watercolour that actually becomes a way of thinking through, you know, theoretically, practice-wise, in terms of, of these spaces. And then with James Carey, his um, project is a kind of art interior-based project where it's, I'm fair to say it, but it's a bit like a Gordon Matter Clark, you know, he cuts up buildings, but, you know, he, he's not sort of just repeating a Gordon Matter Clark, he's doing other things with that from an interior perspective. This is a recent project where he um, was resident in an old flour mill for a period of time. And then Campbell Drake, um, this is a project where what he did was, there's an old theatre in Melbourne and he completely inverted the relationship between the stage and the seating by having um, the audience sitting on the stage and then for a performance that was undertaken. And then Phoebe Whitman's work, which is, you know, looking at surfaces and thinking about um, surface encounter and it, it's, a, it's a project that's very much situated within interior design discourse um, around kind of the valuing of surface and not having to make them deep or profound or it's, it's thinking well the surface is the thing that we're always encountering and how that can be um, activated. And then lastly um, I'm just also working on my own symposium at the moment with, well, with the interior design program called Situation. And there's a bit of a promotion. If you want to come down to Australia, you'd be very welcome. And, but it's looking at it's this, this question of the temporal spatial in relationship to interior. And I guess coming from um, a university and anybody who's involved with universities here as kind of staff, I guess, would be aware of you know, this kind of need to do research and how research is counted. And, um, and again, there's this kind of proposition that's being made here. Well, if there's the ephemeral and temporal, you know, it's not like you have an artifact that can be measured and, you know, by research outcomes or um, a knowledge that can be endlessly repeated, which is one of the definitions of research, then how might, how might we get um, this kind of knowledge that we're working with and producing actually um, understood and, and valued. And this is an artist who will be in the, one of the key situators, is what we're calling Bianca Hester. 
And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susie, for the interesting lecture. You are the real evidence that the world is quite small, that you are here <laughs> from Australia. I have just one question. The experience what I got um, last uh, um, autumn uh, in RMIT that you have there, um, in the undergraduate course, a huge mass, 60 students uh, all over the world, and you are really training them very hard to become critical thinkers. How do you think, um, how could they find work afterwards if you don't um, uh, don't educate them so much with the drawings, the technical part of the projects, and so on. Um, I think we do that as well. I don't don't think. I guess it comes back to that kind of question of um, theory and practice a little bit. It's you know I, I suppose. Um, so I think that uh, there's lots of things to that that question, but I think that we do train them to do that, but in a way which is not, uh, just I keep thinking of my own undergraduate experience and you know, learnt, I did measure drawings of like four flights of stairs that took forever and whatever, and, but it wasn't until I was in a practice, you know, like in a, one of the large commercial firms that, you know, I actually learnt again how to do all of that in many ways. And I think that the main thing that's important for graduates is the ability to learn and to know what they need to learn. And you know, there's a huge array of various, of, of different techniques and different programs, software programs. And often, you know, there's, it's, it's that ability to learn and, and know what you need to learn that I think is kind of the critical thing. But obviously, you know, maybe from your question, there's sort of, you felt like the students that you had didn't have those skills, because... No, no, I just want to... <laughs> No, no, I want, like, yeah. want to agree with you that the fundamentals really uh, lies in, in the theory and, um, and it's, it's university and, and mm. practice can, uh, in practice, uh, you know, people can train themselves in the way how it's, it's needed in mm. specific situations. Because, yeah. for example, say, you know, teaching history and theory is something that's really not taught very much anymore within programs and... Um, and we, we still do it, but you know, I've become very aware that you have to think about how you teach it because it's not, it's not adequate anymore to teach the history of Western whatever from you know, the Egyptians through to now because one, history as a practice has been brought into question. So the idea that you think that all students need to have a logic of this linear progression of the development of humankind is you know it's it's not a very good education for them because it's um, it's a particular view of the world. But in um, in our course, you know, in our program, we have probably forty percent of students that are from all different parts of the world, and you know that Western history is just not relevant. I mean, they might be interested in it, but why don't we teach the history of Chinese art, for example? And we we, we don't because. It it's beyond our knowledge, you know? <laughs> and it's, so that's, that's where I think it's very interesting times that we live in, um, that even you can see it within universities and how they talk about content now. I mean, for better or worse, there's this idea that, that academics and teachers are curators of content, not, not the expertise that stand there, you know, like, and know everything, because knowledge, that sort of knowledge becomes finite very quickly now. And so this idea of um, actually curating content, and partly I think it's because of the internet, and you know, there's just so much, so much information. And information is maybe not the right word, but so many, so many things to know and ways of knowing in the world that it, it becomes a question of, well, what's, what's the best kind of knowledge out there and how to bring it together and to to, to produce something. So there's, there's lots of challenges, I think, for universities. There's many papers that, that get written at the moment around this idea of how the university, as we know it, will no longer exist in you know, 10, 20 years even, just because of the transformation of 
of knowledge. There's a paper called the, Av you know, the Avalanche is Coming. <laughs> And that, you know, everything's quiet, but all of a sudden it'll just transform things. So, you know, that's got to do with online environments. And, and that's a really big challenge as well for design education because so much of the ways of learning um, are face-to-face -face as well and um, within a studio environment and working with materials. And, and um, but, you know, it's not, it's not kind of going, well, we've got to stay in that nostalgic place. It's like... What, what does this all mean? And, you know, and particularly when you think that you be educating somebody, like looking at some kids now when they're six and working with iPads and, and you know, you're going to be teaching them in, well, I won't be, I won't be around, but, you know, in 30 years' time, that it's just a whole, it's different, you know, it's, but we have to think how we work with those challenges and changes. It's exciting. Thank you. I think this is something that they wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. Any questions, please? I'm getting a bit hot now. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. My name is Kairit. I'm a, I'm a student now. And uh, you were briefly talking about the urban um, interior lab. And I would like to know, like, what kind of place is it? Or is it like a research? Or how is it like? funded or how do you actually work there? Just to briefly talk yeah. about how you work. Um, it's, a, it's not a very exciting story really, but uh, <laughs> it, it's new groups were formed in the university because of, um, you know, that it wasn't possible for people to work individually anymore uh, on their research areas of research because there needed to be a critical momentum. And I guess there are a number of people that, that were working or interested in this, in this question of urban interior, and particularly within our interior program. You know, we've had a publication that came out maybe 10, 15 years ago called Interior Cities. And Melbourne, Melbourne's a very interior city. You have to come in August to have a look. But, um, you know, it's, it's got a sense of... of, of you, there was one time many you know, a century ago where you could walk from one end of the city to another in, in un undercover in a fairly kind of conventional idea of what an urban interior is. But so it's always had this quality. And so the group was formed around that. And it's just, it's just been a collection of individuals that kind of come and go. And uh, at the moment, I think it's, um, we really need to invigorate it a bit more. Uh, that people within the group have been involved in other research labs. Like I'm involved in one called Effective Environments which is a bit more where this, the Beyond Building project with the residential care is connected. Um, but I was very interested to be involved with the group um, in, Ma in Milan and Madrid. And I guess what we're doing there is, uh, Tune mentioned that I'm an editor of the Idea Journal. And I'll bring, I've got four copies that I must bring because I don't want to take them back to Melbourne. And um, I'll bring them, bring them in tomorrow. And um, so for the 2015 issue, we're going to be calling for submissions, you know, internationally for papers looking around this question of urban interior because it seems to be a very kind of important kind of question that, that's there. So the, the, the lab is just really a collection of people. It's not, we don't, in universities these days, there's no space, so we don't have an office anywhere or, um, but yeah, and it kind of ebbs and flows a bit. Sorry, I missed that it was uh, related to that or inside the university. Yeah. But that's why I was asking. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah we're very much encouraged in the university um, that, it, and again, it comes back to this relationship between practice and theory is that, that um, you know, it's researching through practice. So the research laboratories are researching through practice around these kind of complex urban issues. And you know, that then also feeds into the, the teaching that we do. So there's a very strong connection between research and teaching. And it's, it's quite a different model to having applied research. So it's not with the students going, oh, you know, you need to know this, you know, blah, blah. It's not instructional. But it's going, well, we're working with this question of interior and we can bring this knowledge that we've got through the, the practice that we've been doing, the projects, and engage students within that. So it's very kind of now. And the students become kind of collaborators in some ways with this, this kind of thinking.
Thank you. Thank you. It's this one. Bertel Dagliga, architectural historian and critic. Um, I've got a somewhat provocative question. Um, I would return to educational is issues and um, I personally have to admit that I've got a problem with this idea about um, research by design and this uh, pra practice-based uh, doctoral studies. Um, what I would like to ask, oh, first of all, I would say that at, at least traditionally, PhD um, has something had to do with the production of new knowledge. Uh, from your perspective, uh, how would you uh, describe how, uh, or how would you define that new knowledge which is produced among those practitioners pursuing their PhDs at the RMIT, for example? How is it different from this traditional knowledge which is produced? Out of, out of the life. I mean, yeah, it's a controversial question and it's one that kind of get, gets asked quite a lot around the practice-based PhDs because they are um, quite different to the, com you know, the conventional PhD and perhaps one of the things, um, and while we've been doing them at RMIT for 30 years, there's a sense that they are kind of new, I guess, to some degree or, and there's various different ways, models or modes that happen within that. So there's not just the one kind of PhD by practice in, at RMIT. And firstly though, I think the thing is, is that what the reason perhaps for some of the controversy is that it really does challenge the idea of what knowledge is. You know, like it, the idea that, that with the PhD and it being the highest form of qualification and therefore, you know, one has to know what that knowledge is in a sense that this is how you would do it. And the doing it through practice perhaps doesn't have those kinds of um, uh, structures or kind of um, understandings around that to sort of go, okay, well, it's proven that this is definitely a, f a, a way of producing knowledge. But so I think it's sort of pushing um, at the idea of what, what knowledge is and in terms of the different models, like they're within RMIT, there's a reflective, what's called the reflective-based mode of um, the PhD, which invites practitioners who have been, you know, in their practice for over a period of 10 years at least, and have a substantial body of work to, and then they're invited in to reflect on their practice. And, um, and then there's other models, which some of the ones that I showed you towards the end, that are more speculative PhDs in that they're candidates who don't have a 10-year body of practice that they reflect on, but they're interested. And this happens more in interior than it does in architecture, um, simply because we don't have the practitioners with a 10-year body of knowledge interested in doing PhDs, but we have a lot of younger candidates doing interior design that are interested to kind of continue to ask these questions that they've been asking in their undergraduate. And so that's more of a speculative kind of PhD, where they've got, you know, like with Rosie, it's around interior as a practice of care, and so the PhD becomes a way of researching that through projects. And I think with that kind of model, you can more easily see how that becomes a, a, contribu a new knowledge or contrib and a contribution to, to practice, because, you know, this kind of posing of the question of interior design as a practice of care, you know, like she would find if there's other people that have done it, and then she, she would situate how you know her practice is is making a contribution there, and with the reflective based mode, which is more a kind of looking back at a practice. Um, you know, I think the the positioning of a practice within you know within a community of practitioners, where there's a kind of clear statement around particular 
concerns and how that practice is making its contribution, you know, I think that's, that's also a contribution of new knowledge back into the community of practice. And you can sort of see how those practitioners that have done PhDs, um, just how they operate differently once they've, they've done that PhD because they have a sense of what that practice is in a, in a particular way and clear about what its contribution is. So, you know, this, the question of what new knowledge is, is is perhaps at the heart of that. I mean, I'd, ask, I'd, I'd like to know from you how you define what new knowledge might be. And, you know, in the, in the conventional PhD, I think that um, <coughs> we can continue with these conversations during the day because this is quite a wide and very interesting part of this symposium just now. Thank you, Su Susie, for your interesting uh, lecture. And we have our lunch. And I think we can gather 2 o'clock and 15 minutes. So thank you. Thank you.